Welcome to church today. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for joining us online. And man, it's a... It's an emotional week. This is my last Christmas Eve as the pastor of West Winds, and so I have all the feels. I'm excited for, for those services, and uh, man, I tell you what, I don't know that I ever held anything back at previous Christmas Eves, but certainly I'm going to go home with an empty tank on December the 24th. And I, I tell you, the reason that that's so important to me is because like, when you come on Christmas Eve, you're not coming alone. I mean, you get the privilege of, of coming to a great church, a church that I love, a church I've been privileged to serve for a long time. And when you're here, you feel the love and the affection pouring out from all the volunteers, from all the staff. You feel it in the building. You feel it in all the little details. You feel the history and the legacy of faith here. But on Christmas Eve, you're going to bring people with you that, that are going to experience that for the first time. And Christmas is such a, 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 has such a hallmark quality to it. And I mean that in the best way. Like, you come with a sense of family built into it. You come with a sense of hope and expectation built into it. You come with the burden of the last year slowly falling off your back as you walk into the story of God and the story of God's grace and the opportunity to be renewed. And that's, that's what we offer at West Winds. We do that every week, but, but in Christmas, it's got a little extra oomph. So I want you to know your elders and your staff are praying for your family. We're praying for them every day, all the time. We are working to do everything we can to communicate the good news of the gospel of God to people that you love. And we know you're praying for them too. So Christmas Eve and Christmas Eve Eve and Christmas Eve way late at night when all the kids are crying and all the grandparents are exhausted, man, we're going to have a great experience here inviting the Spirit of God to heal us and restore our hopes for the future. Amen. Amen. Now, we're in a series on Advent, and uh, a couple weeks ago, we started talking about this season that historically is a season of waiting. In the first week in our series, we talked about uh, what the people of first century Palestine were waiting for. They were waiting for a Savior. We talked about the qualities of that Savior, what they were hoping for specifically. Last week, we asked the question, what are Christians historically waiting for? The return of Jesus when he fully and finally heals the world. But today... I think it's important to ask the question, like, what is God waiting for? And maybe to put it more sharply, what was God waiting for? Because, you know, the beginning stories of the Bible are about the creator creating creation and placing creators with it to perpetuate that creation, that God made people to work with God, to be like God, and to continue the development of God's creation. It's a cooperative endeavor, a participatory endeavor in which we get to work with God to continue complexifying and beautifying the world, the relationships, the the, the culture. We get to enjoy life the way God intended. But real quick, that plan got way off track. The scripture records an incident in which a, a serpentine creature, an accuser, came to Adam and Eve, our spiritual ancestors, and tempted them with the things we're all tempted with, ego and control. Why work with God when you can just do it on your own? Why listen when you can just do whatever you want? What, doing whatever you want is going to be better anyway. And sure enough, Adam and Eve disobeyed, strayed from God, settled for something less, which ironically they were deceived into thinking something was more. And we got way off track. And right away, God knew this was a problem. And God told them prophetically that there would be a solution to the fracture in divine human relationships. That there was going to be a a rescue plan. A savior was coming. Somebody that would crush the head of the serpent. Now, here's the question we all ask. Okay, We don't know how long ago this happened exactly. Who knows? Maybe 6,000 years ago, maybe 8,000 years ago, may, may, maybe more. We don't know how long. But the question we all have to ask is, like, why didn't you just fix it right then? Like, if you ever spill red wine on white carpet... You know you've got about four seconds to get rid of that mess before the carpet is ruined for forever. Right? Don't you think a quick solution would have been in order for sin that corrupted creation? Like, why did God wait? 
If we needed somebody to kill a serpent, like apparently there were angels with flaming swords hanging around outside. You couldn't send one of them to be the dragon killing machine? That didn't work out for you? Like why wait? Why did you let people go through century, millennia of alienation, of frustration, of violence, power struggles, control? Why, why did the Hebrew people get enslaved? Why, why were they subjected to genocide? Why did their kingdom get torn in half? Why were they disparated from one another? Why? Why? If that's all the effects of sin, why didn't God put an end to sin earlier? Well, if you go back and forth in the book, like many of us have, you realize that God, God's pretty committed to working through people. Now, ironically, we don't really like that message. Like, I don't want God to work through people because I know people, and they kind of suck. I want God to just do it himself. When I got a problem, I want God to fix it. I want God to do things for me. I want God to do things to me. I don't want to lose weight. I want God to make me taller so that my weight is appropriate. <laughs> but God doesn't do stuff to us and for us, not, not in the way that we hope. God instead does stuff with us. And through us. And a human being had got us into this mess. And a human being was going to need to get us out of it. And so God starts his search for a human being that can resolve the problem of our fragmentation. Of our despair. Of our isolation and... Well, it's a long search. You think it's tricky finding a new pastor. Whew. This was a trick that took a long time to resolve. I mean, God starts out with a fellow named Abraham. We don't know why God picks Abraham. We just know he, he picks this fellow named Abraham. Lives in a strange part of the world, a part of the world that's developing, up and coming. And God says, I'm going to work with you. Through you, Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So get up and go to a land where I will show you. And Abraham initially is obedient. But somewhere along the line, he, like he makes a few missteps. He starts um, telling lies. Starts using women in peculiar and strange and inappropriate ways, starts breaking his word and violating treaties. I mean, Abraham's kind of a hot mess. And we realize God can't get the job done through Abraham. I mean, he wasn't totally useless, but he just wasn't the right man. And because of Abraham's failure, we, we get generation upon generation of disappointment and angst, and fury. Lo and behold, God's people end up enslaved to the Egyptians. And for 500 years, they call out for God to save them. But God was still waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. Who was he waiting for? In that case, he was waiting for Moses. God finds this princeling. And raises him up to be a great deliverer. And everybody's excited for a hot second about Moses. Maybe this is the, the real savior we've been looking for. I mean, if you ask most practicing Jews today, they really consider the, the story of their ethnicity and of their religion to be rooted in the story of the Exodus. The Moses story where God supernaturally delivers them from oppression. And so Moses looks pretty good. Till he becomes frustrated and angry, recalcitrant disobedient, wayward, can't control his family, can't control himself, and ultimately Moses is not even allowed to participate in the promise God made to Moses' people. Well, great. Strike two. Now there's lots of little disappointments between Abraham and Moses, and lots of little disappointments between Moses and the first great king of Israel, King David. A little shepherd boy that had no rights to any sort of royalty or authority. He was the run to the litter, handsome, artsy-fartsy, maybe pretty good with a bow, but, but he couldn't keep it in his pants. And he loved to fight. And he loved to kill. And so this man that was after, a man after God's own heart turned out to be a great disappointment too because according to the Bible anyway, Having a good heart just isn't enough. 
you got to do more than like the right things. So you get all this story. It's disappointment upon disappointment upon disappointment. You go, why didn't God stop it? Because he was looking for a good man. A good man was hard to find. So enter Jesus, the one perfect man. And we like to think that Jesus cheated. You know, that's our little joke. I say our, I mean, that's our culture's little joke because Jesus was God made flesh. God became man that we might become like God. Jesus was a model and an example for us of what it means to be a healthy human being, a robust human being, someone completely certain of who he was and what he was meant to do. But, of course, Jesus was more than that, too. He was as much above us as one of us. And by participating in the life, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, by receiving the spirit of Jesus, we realize God has solved the problem of sin. We just got some cleanup skirmishes to do, but it took such a long time. Like, why did God wait however many thousands of years before finally sending Jesus? Why not just send Jesus right away? And the truth is, God was waiting to see how they did. Like, Abraham, he wasn't perfect. But he wasn't horrendous either. Moses wasn't perfect, but he's a towering figure of historical Judaism. David, not exemplary by any stretch, but at the same time, a remarkable human being. And you realize when you look back and and you play fair, you look at all the evidence for all these people, you realize they weren't wholly evil and they weren't wholly good. They were um, human. Human. And sometimes it's comforting for you and I to judge them Oh, look at their misogyny. Look at their evil. Look at their greed. As though we don't have any of that? I mean, come on. Let he who's without sin cast the first stone, right? Or we look at them and we forget about their sins. We just look at their virtues and their victories. Well, that doesn't help either. Because we know our own flaws, so glossing over theirs doesn't make us feel better about ourselves. It just contributes to the shame that religion so easily cultivates. No, we, we look back and we realize God was giving them a chance. God was waiting and waiting and waiting to see if any one of them would pick up the mantle and, and try. No, I, I want you to think about this for just a, a little moment. I mean, God knew they weren't going to be good enough, right? He's God. He's got to know a couple things. He knew they weren't going to be good enough, and yet he gave them the chance anyway. The chance to rise above their circumstances. The chance to swing for the fences. The the chance to be redeemed. The chance to recover. The chance to get back on their feet and go after it again. But he gave them the opportunity to be more knowing that they wouldn't be enough, knowing that they would never be able to accomplish everything, God nevertheless gave them the opportunity to do something. And that matters. What they did with what they had matters. And it's no different for you and me. I mean, now we're in a different season of waiting. We we ask Why was God waiting? What was God waiting for? Now we're asking, what's God waiting for now? Jesus showed up, promises he's coming back to fully and finally heal the world, and uh, lunchtime's almost over, JC. When are you coming back, man? Why isn't God fixing it? Why isn't God fixing our government? Why isn't God fixing your marriage? Why isn't God fixing your finance? Why, Why is not everything better. Well, Peter, in his second letter, he gets to this very issue. He says, don't overlook this one important fact, friends. A day with the Lord is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. And God is not slow in fulfilling his promise. God's patient. 
with you. God is patient with you. For God does not wish that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's waiting so that no one should perish, but that everyone might reach repentance. See, think about that. Like, um, why doesn't Jesus show up and fix everything tomorrow, eradicating evil from the world? Well, because then all the people that you're bringing with you on Christmas Eve wouldn't have the opportunity to hear the good news of the gospel of God. What, what a tragedy if God didn't delay just a couple more days. Why, why didn't God come in uh, 1975? Well, because God wanted to give the opportunity for you to find out who you would become. God wanted to give you the chance to live and experience life and life more abundant. The gift of God is eternal life, Paul says in Romans 6. God's given you this gift. And you know, sometimes I'll, I'll be studying the Bible, I'll read reading the Bible, and I get this like, um, like this spider sense kind of tingle, this sort of itchy sensation, this theological discomfort where I go, oh, I bet if I keep looking at this passage, I'll, I'll find something new, something that I have not previously recognized. I bet if I turn it over, study the original languages, read some commentaries, ruminate it prayerfully, I bet I'm going to find something in here that I, I haven't fully appreciated yet. And that happened to me this week. God's not slow. God's patient with you. Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. The Greek word there is apolumai. God doesn't want anyone to apolumai. Now, in, in the biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, we, they have all have what, a, what we call a semantic range. It means one word can mean a bunch of things. They had less words in those languages than we do in English. So you study apolumai. What is it that God doesn't want anybody to do? You know what the second most common translation is of that word? Not perish, as in God doesn't want you to die. God is patient, not willing that any should be rendered useless. God doesn't want you to be Useless. Because you're not. Abraham wasn't good enough, but he wasn't useless. Through him, God's multi millennia plan first came into the world to bless and love and redeem and restore. You know, Moses wasn't perfect, but neither was he useless. A liberator, a savior, a prototype of Christ to come. I mean, he wasn't useless. His life mattered. David wasn't perfect, but he wasn't useless. An artist, a worshiper, a leader, somebody who found a place of repentance again and again and again despite his many scenes, that they weren't useless, and neither are you. God is giving you the freedom and the opportunity to make your life count. And God's not just giving you that opportunity. God's waiting to see what you're going to do with it. And in your mind, you might think, oh, you know, who am I? I'm just, you know, so, some little old person. I can't make it. Listen, you matter. Stop all that negative self-talk. Quite beating yourself up all the time. You matter to us. You matter to your church. You matter to your family. You matter to your community. You matter to your neighbors. And it's so easy for us to believe that about others and yet simultaneously deny it about ourselves. But we need you. We need you, and we need you to step up and step forward to accept the call of God upon your life, to recognize that God's spirit is in you. God has gifted and ennobled and empowered you for this season. And God's waiting to see what you're going to do with it. You got this chance. And you might have screwed up all the others. It was a long time before Moses got his issue sorted out. It was a long time before Abraham and Sarah, his wife, got on track. But a thousand years to the Lord is like a day. Fifty-seven years to the Lord is like a day. Twenty-three years to the Lord is like a day. 
And God's waiting to see what you're going to do with all that has been entrusted to you. Not willing that anyone should be rendered useless, the scripture says, but that all might find a place of repentance. I love that. Repentance, we know, is turning away from the behaviors, the relationships, the habits, the practices, the ontology that displeases God. But equally, that means we're turning towards something else. You're not just turning away from the garbage, you're turning toward the king. Like the apostle Paul says, I press on toward the prize. Everybody runs is to get the prize. What prize are you running toward? Because you're not just abandoning toxicity, you're abandoning those false prizes of ego, power, greed, Lust, self-control, you're running instead toward love and self-sacrifice, friendship, healing, and blessing. And God's waiting to see how you're going to do. So friends, when we ask this question, if Advent is a season of waiting, what's God waiting for? You're it. Lord, when are you going to heal my family? Well, I'll tell you what. Jesus isn't here in the flesh anymore. But I got somebody with the same spirit as Jesus. Somebody who's equipped to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. I got somebody who's going to be an ambassador for the cause of Jesus. I got somebody who's an heir with Jesus in eternity. And it's you. So who's going to heal your family? It's you. Who is God sending to restore your community? You. You are a missionary to your own people. Now, you don't go alone. You go with the gifts of God. You go with the spirit of God. You go with the people of God. You're not alone. But you're it. It's you. Who's going to raise your children? Who's going to love your husband? Who's going to honor your mother and father? Who's going to grow your business? Who's going to take care of your body? You. Remember a couple years ago, there was that old song uh, by some really pretty blonde lady encouraging Jesus to take the wheel. It's a terrible song. I don't care how pretty you are. You can't make that song good. I mean, she came close, but no dice. Jesus, take the wheel. It's a terrible idea. You know why? Well, first of all, you crash and die. That's good. A lot of people on I-94 are letting Jesus take the wheel after they've had a few drinks and take a little nap on the freeway. But more, Jesus calls us his body. Like, you got Jesus' hands, and you got Jesus' feet. So if Jesus is going for a drive, you better be the one on the left. How frustrated must Jesus be to look at his church and see all us people going, let go and let God. He's going, no, let, no I sent you. I sent you to resolve those problems. I sent you to bring hope and healing. I sent you. Jesus said, the Father has sent me, so now I send you. He said, go into the world and preach the gospel. Not go and let Jesus take the wheel. No. You are God's answer to a culture of fragmentation, loneliness, and despair. You are the only Jesus they're ever going to see. What's God waiting for? He's waiting for you. Don't make him wait any longer. Lord, thank you for continuing to believe in us, for continuing to, to trust and hope that we can be the church you envisioned when you gave your son, when you gave your life, when you gave your promise, when you gave your spirit, and help us, Lord, because we, we don't think we can do it. We're scared and we're dumb. and So help us listen to your spirit inside of us. Because you promised you'd guide us. You promised you wouldn't leave us alone.
You promised you'd give us wisdom and insight. You promised you would order our steps. You promised you'd give us discernment. You promised you'd give us understanding. You promised you'd give us strength and grace and love beyond measure. So, Lord, we're ready. We're ready. Teach us, lead us, and guide us into all truth that we might glorify and honor you. Things, things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.